Let's have a look at some of my favorite perennials. And I've split them into sun, part shade, and shade, so you have some idea of where to plant them. My favorite list of perennials is a really, really long list, so it's hard to pare it down here. But I've tried to pick plants that are fairly easy to get, but not really common. And I've also tried to pick plants that fit into that good perennial category. So here's one called Penstemon, Huskers Red. The Penstemons are North American natives. This one is a cultivar, but it's still close to being a native. And they're pretty good plants. The problem with most penstemons is that they're short-lived. So even in nature, they'll live two to three years and then they're gone. So you do have to be a little careful which ones you pick. This one I've had in the garden for at least 10 years and it's a very reliable one. It seems to come back every year. There are some really good penstemons. This is an Ontario native one that I really like. It's called Hirsutus. And it only grows about a foot tall it's covered in these little white flowers, or they're kind of a pale purple, maybe. It also comes in a pure white one and a blue one, I think. And it also comes as a pygmy version. So there's a variety of this that only grows about five inches tall. Quite reliable, comes back year after year. Seeds around a little bit, not too bad. Blooms a fairly long time, and by that I mean like three weeks or so. Here's another one that's really bright called Sour Grapes. I'm not quite sure how well this one returns, but it'll last for two or three years. And then I've had some stay and others not. But I've grown a number of these from seed. They just don't come back. And I've tried year after year. I grow the seed, flowers for two years, and then it's gone. So you have to watch which penstemons you pick. This one I talked about, it is really one of my favorites. There's nothing to do with this plant, and it just keeps flowering and flowering. I just love it. Now, there's lots of geraniums. This is another pretty good one. It's taller, and I don't know the name exactly, but it is a geranium pretense of some cultivar. It grows about three and a half feet tall, makes a really nice set of flowers. But this one is more like your typical geranium. So most geranium, and I'm talking garden geraniums here, will grow up, they look quite nice as plants, then they'll flower for three weeks, and then they're finished. And then they do get kind of ugly. So what I do about midsummer is I come along here and cut this to the ground, and then it regrows. And this is the same. This is maybe one of my favorite geraniums. I've had this one probably 30 years, and I always bring it with me when I move. It's called Magnificum. It's a cross between two species. So whenever you see a plant name with an X there, so you, you don't really pronounce the X, so it's Geranium Magnificum. The X means that it's a primary hybrid. So we've taken two species, crossed them, and the offspring gets the X. It's a fabulous plant. The flowers are quite large for a geranium, but you get this three weeks and then it's done. And then you have to cut it back. This is another really great plant. People come to my garden and they come in at the front, is near the front of the garden, and they'll just kind of head towards it because it's such an eye-appealing plant. It's five, almost six feet tall. It seems to bloom for months, and nobody knows what it is, which is great. So I usually tell people it's an astilbe on drugs. It looks like an astilbe, but it's not really related to them. It's a persicaria called a fleece flower. This is actually two plants, but it could just be one. I just happened to put two in there. This is a plant that's a true perennial, even though it looks like a shrub. In spring, there's nothing there. Suddenly, it makes a little growth. It seems like two weeks later, it's like three feet tall, and then it flowers. And the nice thing about the flowers is they seem to last a long time. And I'm gonna come back to this on a couple plants in this talk. But when a plant flowers a long time, it's not always because it actually flowers that long. What we're seeing are the bracts. So the flower itself is usually inside, and the bracts are more colorful than the flower is, and the bracts can last a long time. And when we can find perennials with this feature, we end up with something that appears to flower for a very long time in the garden. This thing will, looks like it flowers for two months. It starts out quite white and slowly gets golden and tan color, but it's there a long time. 
The other plant that I'm pretty sure you know about, the red plant we get at Christmas. Those aren't flowers. The flowers are tiny little things inside. And what we're looking at are the red bracts. And that's why it seems to flower so long. We talked about foxgloves. Almost all of them are biannual. So they'll flower, you get a great display, and then they're usually gone. But there are some that are perennial, and this is one of them. It's maybe not the most spectacular color, but it will come back year after year after year. It's a very long-lived perennial. These are great little plants, the trolleus. Two to three feet tall. They come in slightly different leaf shapes, slightly different colors of flowers, some very orange, some nice and yellow, some pale yellow. I have some that are now, uh, they're only six inches tall when they're full flower. Other ones are four feet tall. They all originate from the mountains, so they grow in cool conditions, but they grow wet. So they're actually growing in the water that's melted from the snow. The interesting thing with this plant is you can put it anywhere. I have it in part shade. I have it in full sun. None of them get a particularly large amount of water, and they do well in all those locations. Seems to be very long-lived, easy to grow from seed. They're a great plant. Now, I don't know if you'll recognize this plant, but this is a hen and chick. And when I give a talk in person, I usually see the audience and see how many hands go up. And most people have, are very surprised that hen and chicks actually flower. But they do. And they're either in this kind of reddish color or they're a yellow color, depending on the species. But the mother plant is half dead by the time you get these flowers. So what you don't want to do is buy a really large hen and chick without babies around it because if it's really large it's quite possible that you'll bring it home you'll put it in the garden it will flower later that summer and it's gone you've lost it so when you buy these always make sure that there's two or three in the pot or if it's a big one make sure there's some babies around it the babies don't die they will continue to grow and get large and then when they flower they will also die now, a lot of people like lamb's ear, very common. It's in every perennial book I've ever picked up. And I think it's a horrible plant. Okay, now it has these nice fuzzy leaves, which are kind of nice. The flowers are sort of bluish. They're not particularly nice, but it seeds everywhere. So I had it in my garden for a number of years and I kept pulling it out everywhere and it was just a nightmare. Well, there's this other one called Helen von Stein or the big ears. And it's great. It also has those fuzzy leaves. Now, maybe not quite as fuzzy. This one hardly ever flowers, so it doesn't make seed. It slowly spreads, and it's a great plant. You can put it in. It's a great ground cover. It only grows six inches tall, maybe eight inches tall, and you just leave it. And I have it on the side of the hill, and it's been there for probably 12 years. I don't never do anything to this plant. I don't clean it up in spring. I don't weed it because it grows nice and thick. Maybe every four years I'll hack it apart because it's getting too big and I give some away. Here's another stacky. A stackies are all the lamb's ears that I much prefer over the other one. And it's called humello. It's a shorter plant. The leaves aren't quite as nice. They're not as fuzzy, but it makes a nice plant. Nice flowers. Flowers for three weeks. It's just a great plant. And again, it just sits there. It spreads a little bit, but... You can have this in the same spot for 10 years and never do anything to it. Every once in a while, you'll see a little seedling near it. You know, maybe one a year if you're lucky. That's it. No maintenance perennial. When I first seen this, I just fell in love with it. I'd never seen it before. Walked through this garden, seen it at the end of this pathway, and I just almost ran to it. It's a fabulous plant in some ways. It's called Bear's Breeches. There are three species. They all kind of look the same. Some are hardy in zone 5, some are not. So if you buy one around here, it probably is going to be hardy. It's an interesting plant in that you buy the plant, put it in the ground, and it grows a little bit, but nothing happens. I had it in the same spot three years, still wasn't flowering. It really wasn't getting very big. So I went out and bought another one put it in a different spot. And I do that a lot with perennials. I'll try two or three different locations to see which one that likes best. 
still didn't flower. So I put it in a third spot and then they all flowered. In fact, my first plant, I think it had 15 flower spikes the first year. And the interesting thing about this plant is that most of what you see there are the bracts. It's not the flower. So it seems to flower a very long time. Now it has two downsides. One is that it does seed around a little bit. And the second thing is that root is really hard to dig out. So if you want to move this or get rid of it, it will come back. It's a big, deep tap root and it just seems to come back year after year. The other one is that it does have some very sharp spikes in those flowers and they will hurt you. Of course, that means the deer leave alone. Amazonias are North American natives. They're not grown very much. If you want to try one, try blue ice. It's a nicer color. It's a short plant. I like all the Amazonias. I grow about seven different species. This is not my picture. Almost every other picture in this program is from my garden. I now have this plant. They're still a little small, so I can't get a picture like this. It's again an Amazonia, but it's grown for these ferny type leaves, and it goes a real nice yellow in the fall. So I'm still waiting to see this in the fall. I love iris. I do grow some German bearded iris, but they're such ugly plants. We have something called Siberian iris. Now, admittedly, the flowers are not quite as nice, but the plants are nice. They look like grass in the spring. They flower. They get color in the fall, so they go kind of red. You don't have to divide them. They don't get iris bore. They're just easy to take care of. I mean, why fight these things? There are so many perennials to choose from. We might as well grow some that are really easy to grow. This is a Japanese iris, which is somewhat similar. It blooms a little later. And then this is a really large one. That flower is the size of my hand. It's just an absolutely gorgeous plant. The leaves itself aren't quite as nice, but this flower is just fantastic. This is a plant I've had forever, and I just love it. It's a Euphorbia polychroma. We have these yellow flowers and they stay on there for two months. Uh, by now you might guess that those aren't the flowers. Those are the bracts. So it has these yellow bracts and they're pretty all the time. It's going to start flowering in another couple weeks. It's quite early. And then by the end of the summer, it's a nice tall perennial and looks nice all summer long. It does seed around a little bit, but I have two or three extra plants every year that I dig up for friends and plant sales and so on. So it's not too bad. Another euphorbia is chameleon, which I really like. It spreads a bit too much, but it's pretty easy to pull out. And when I'm looking at perennials and the ability for them to spread by seed, one of the things I'm always looking at is the type of root system they have. Can I pull this out easily? So the root on something like this is a fibrous root, so I can just pull on it. Something like a dandelion is not easy to pull out. You always leave some behind and it regrow. So perennials that seed themselves and make a tap root, I don't really like because they're too much work for me. This one is a deep red and it comes out quite early. It's already starting to leaf out. It's great in the first half of the summer and then I just cut it right back. It does flower, but they're kind of insignificant. Now we're into part shade plant. There's several ligularias. This is probably the most common one. There's one called Brit Marie, and I think this is a seedling of it. The leaves are quite red, particularly on the underside. The flowers are okay. Not one of my favorite, but it is a very interesting plant and it's three or four feet tall. So I grow it. I like this one much better. It's also a ligularia called the rocket. The leaves are a little more interesting and then it makes these long flower spikes coming up the center. And if you look at this, you can see that the bottom part is open. Those buds have opened, but the top part are still buds that are opening later. So it slowly opens and crawls up the stem. So it actually has a very long blooming period because of this. If you don't like a big plant like this, there is some smaller versions of the rocket now available. Japanese anemones are great plants from one point of view. Flower late in the year. They have really colorful flowers. They're nice and large. The problem with these plants is they just spread sideways. They have runners and they just run like crazy. So I've pulled it out of most of my beds because it's just too much work. I can't go and divide these clumps every year to keep them in scale. 
If you take this and put it in a shady area, they don't spread quite so much and still flower fairly well. If you're going to pick one of these Japanese anemones, Pamina is a really nice one. It's a little shorter, has nice color, and doesn't spread quite so much, but it's still a spreader. I love the Rogersias. They're big plants, big leaves. There are five species. You can easily get a dozen different cultivars, and they're just fabulous plants. Beautiful flowers. Again, these are mostly bracts that you see, so it looks as if it's flowering for a very long period of time. The one problem with this plant is that it comes up very early in the spring, but really can't take frost. So that new growth will get killed with a late frost. But that doesn't matter because it just makes more growths after that. So I have a big clump and it's slowly spreading. Beautiful plant. It does come as smaller plants with red flowers and red leaves. This one does like a bit of water. In fact, it probably would like a lot of water. This is growing on the north side of my house. It doesn't get watered a lot there, but it doesn't get much sun. And so the water tends to stay in the soil there and it does all right. The Acteas are great plants. Some of them are native to Ontario that are not. They flower very late, which is very nice because there aren't a lot of plants that will flower in late September or October. And this one does a good job. This one I think I've lost. I think one of its neighbors has grown too big. And I remember during the winter this year that I haven't seen it for a while. So I cut its neighbor back and hopefully I'll see it again. This one's a little hard to find called White Pearl. And it's one of the last plants in the garden to flower. I love the goat's beards. There's a larger one that's available. And I love this little dwarf one. This is only about six to eight inches tall as far as the leaves go and then the flowers go above that. The flowers aren't spectacular, but this is just a really nice clumping plant. But it's quite tiny. And we'll look at some plants for shade. I love Jack Frost. It has these beautiful leaves. It has blue forget-me-not flowers early on. And then I cut those off because if you leave them, they kind of destroy the look of the plant once the leaves start to grow. So I get rid of those. I let them flower and then I get rid of them. Then I let the leaves come out. But what I've noticed with this plant is that it takes a year or two to make a really nice clump like this. And then two years later, the clump kind of falls apart and it just doesn't look good. It's healthy, but now it's kind of made several plants that are kind of competing with each other. I think this is a plant that really needs to be dug up every three years and replanted. And then you'll get this nice kind of roundish shape from it. There are a number of new cultivars out. To me, they all kind of look like Jack Frost. Now, this is a very interesting plant. This is flowering right now or going to flower in the next week. It flowers along with the snowdrops. Very few people have ever seen the flower. And this is the plant, a Japanese butterbur. And it makes huge leaves. It's a fantastic plant. The problem with it, it runs like crazy. So it will spread two feet in every direction if you let it. So what I do with this plant now is I put it in a large pot. So this is a tree pot that's maybe two feet across. I cut the bottom out of that pot, sink it in the soil so the rim is an inch or two above the soil, and then I plant this inside. And it spreads with runners that are about an inch below the surface of the soil. And they go out to the pot. They don't go up or down. They just then start going around and around in a circle. And about every five years, I dig it up because this pot's so full of roots and runners. But it seems to be fine like that. Now, I've tried this with other perennials that spread a lot. And some of them just hate being in that pot. But some do quite well. This is Viola dancing geisha. Some violas spread like crazy and they've been banned from my garden. But this one has not. I just wish I could figure out how to make it grow better. I love ferns. Probably go 50 different kinds of ferns, but of all of them, I think this is my favorite, the Sharples. When you grow ferns, you have to research them and figure out what they need. Some like to be wet, some like to be dry. Some like full sun, some like shade. If you put them in the right spot, they're super easy to grow. Miss Sharples need some shade and lots of moisture. 
If it's sitting in a wet location, it just grows like crazy. If you put it in a drier soil, even if it gets the shade, it just won't do well. It needs moisture. But you can pick one of these for the garden that you have. So if you have a drier area, just pick a fern that grows there. This one, for example, will grow in very heavy shade and very dry conditions. Berries and cream is a fantastic little plant. And when it's young, it looks like this. It makes a nice clump. About halfway through the summer, those leaves start getting brown. And I just cut the whole thing to the ground just for aesthetic purposes. The plant doesn't need that. And then it makes new leaves and in the fall it looks good again. I've now had to divide this clump and I've got about five or six clumps all in one area. So it should show really nice this year. This is an Ontario native that almost nobody grows and we really should grow a lot more of it. Tiarella cordifolia. The plant itself is only about three inches tall and then Late spring, it makes these nice flowers, and the top of the flowers are maybe a foot. I don't think quite that tall, maybe like 10 inches. It runs around the ground, and it spreads quite a bit. But the secret to this plant is to put it next to larger things, like between your hostas. It can't compete with the hosta because the hosta is a taller plant. So even though it runs everywhere, the only place it does well is the spaces between the larger plants, and there it makes a nice ground cover. I love Solomon Seal. They have such pretty flowers. They're really easy to grow. I grow them in a number of different spots. Very dry, very shady, part sun, doesn't seem to matter. They're always going to be happy. Hellebores are really popular these days. I don't particularly care for them, at least not this one. The reason is that the flowers are all facing down and I want to see the flowers. Now the breeders are working on that. So if you want some of these, what I would do is buy them in flower and make sure they're up facing. The newer cultivars will do that. Don't buy them out of flower because you don't know what you're getting. People think these are very tender plants. They're not. Once you've had these for a while, you realize they're really tough plants. I've taken a large clump and just hacked it apart, made 20 little plants, planted them all throughout my woods, never watered them. They're all alive and all growing. It's a very tough plant, very drought tolerant, and it makes seeds and the seeds drop right underneath the mother plant. So as long as the mother plant is healthy and large, the seedlings never grow. When you move one of the mother plants though, you find all these little seedlings underneath. So if you have a friend who has some of these, go visit them and this is a good time in the spring and just move the leaves around. You'll find little seedlings all over in there. This is again one of these plants that we're, we're looking at the bracts. The flowers are quite insignificant in the middle. They only last two weeks, but the bracts last four months and that's why people really like these. Again, we gotta look for perennials that have that characteristic. I like this hellebore much better. It's called the stinking hellebore. It doesn't really stink. If you rub the leaves, you kind of have this funny odor, but that's about it. It looks like this all year long. The middle of winter, it looks like this, unless it's covered in snow. Its flowers aren't as spectacular. They're kind of a greenish color. And in zone five, some years those flowers will get killed and some years it flowers just fine. But I don't grow it for the flowers anyways. I grow it for that leaf shape. It's short-lived, at least in my garden. So it'll last for four years, maybe five. But by the time it dies, it has babies all the way around it. So you never lose the plant. In fact, I'm finding it seeding itself maybe a little more than I would prefer. The good thing is I have no problem giving this plant away. Everybody wants, so it's not a pest for me. When people go to the store and ask for a shade plant that grows in very dry conditions, so we're talking about underneath some kind of tree, this is one plant that a lot of nurseries are recommending, Epimediums. And you can probably buy six different cultivars now. It's a great plant and it does well in that kind of a condition. But where it really wants to be is in quite a sunny spot with lots of water. And then it does even better. 
But this is one of these workhorse plants that you just put in and slowly it gets bigger and bigger. If it has really terrible soil and is really dry, it spreads a little slower. It does have interesting flowers in the spring, but they're quite small. And most pictures of these are close-up pictures, but the flowers are kind of the size of your thumbnail. And quite honestly, they're not that spectacular. I like the leaves. Nice red coloration. Covers the ground. You never have to weed under them. Love that. Erythroniums are North American natives. They're Hard to come by, but this one's fairly popular. Beautiful flower, easy to grow. If you ever see it, get it. They do tend to be a bit pricey. So if you're paying $4 for a bulb, that's not unusual. And the bulbs are not very big, but Pagoda is worth buying. These are trout lilies. They're beautiful because they bloom really late in the season. You can sort of see all the other leaves are kind of going yellow and brown. End of season, these things now start to flower. They have very interesting flowers. In my garden, they're all short-lived. So I'll, I'll show you these because they're fantastic, but I'm not sure how to make them last. I haven't been successful with them. All right, so those are some of my favorite plants. I put a little ebook together. It's available on Amazon. It's uh, some of my best plants. These are all a bit of uh, unusual plants. You can get them all in nurseries, but you might have to hunt for them a little bit. It's only available as an ebook from Amazon. You know, 100 plants, lots of colored pictures, and a whole five bucks US. Here's the other book I write is Garden Myths, book one and two. And this is really my main hobby is writing about garden myths. And both of them have about 120 different myths in them. And those are available from Amazon too. 